I'm charting Bobby Fischer's Road to Reykjavik and we've reached the candidates final. The Protrosian Fischer match played in 1971 in Buenos Aires. Now I'm going to show you game two. Just a quick reminder in game one, Fischer won after he was caught in an opening trap. If you want to see that game, then do click on the I above there and you'll find the link to that game. But a reminder, Fischer has gone one up. He defeated the seemingly invincible Petrosian and that meant that Fischer had won 20 classical games in a row. Extraordinary. So game two, Petrosian with the white pieces and Fischer plays a Grunfeld, a very sharp option. Obviously he wants to somehow you know, take the initiative in the match. He's already won up, so why not, you know, destabilize Petrosian again? Um, Bishop f4. And now c5 from Fischer. You can just castle there, but c5 is also possible. And typical Grunfeld, of course, you want to try and soften up this pawn and soften up this diagonal for that fantastic bishop on g7. And the other thing in this variation, particularly with the bishop having uh, developed so early in the game, then that means that, well, all these diagonals and b2, they're a bit weaker. And queen a5 seeks to exploit that. So rook c1 is normal to protect the knight on c3. And now here, Pawn takes pawn is the steadiest option, um, but well, white does have a little bit of initiative there. Maybe Fisher felt that that would be to Petrosian's taste. So he played knight e4. So trying to exploit this pin here, all these pieces hitting the knight on c3. So this is very double edged now. But Petrosian was ready for this. He played queen d2, pinning that knight. And now we plunge into great complications. Queen takes pawn, so the black's queen going on an adventure here. And now Fischer declined to exchange queens. He brought the queen back to a5. In fact, it is possible to take on d2. Um, Kasparov tried that against Karpov in their 1986 match, but, but lost while well, Karpov played a very fine game. Um, Fischer came back with the queen. Probably a better move, actually. And here, uh, knight f3 has become the main line. That was played in a, a kramnik Carlsen game, which finally ended in a draw. Um, but Petrosian played knight e2. And here, probably best for black just to castle and then to take on c5 with the knight. It's, well, with this centre and potential, you know, to put the rooks on the open files here, well, white should be a little bit better, but it's not too bad for black. But Fischer played knight e5. And now he should take here but instead he played bishop f5. He played this apparently very quickly, and this is a clear mistake. And I suspect that he had underestimated Petrosian's next move, which was simply to play bishop takes knight. I suspect that this kind of, well, slightly anti-positional move, giving up bishop for knight, Fischer somehow hadn't considered it seriously. But this gives white the initiative. Knight here, attacking this bishop. Um, if this bishop retreats, let's say bishop to d7, then actually this is just a clear extra pawn for white. Um, nice position. And this bishop, you can see, looks down on f7. Once the black bishop moves, White is in control there, and that pawn on c6 is, well, once the bishop moves, it's basically just a clear extra pawn. So knight d4 has just been played. So Fischer 
took this pawn instead, but that allows this bishop to be exchanged off. Now, let's just take stock of the position. So if we count the pawns, it's actually still even material. But the real difference between the two positions is the position of the kings. Petrosian's king is safe. Behind four pawns on the king side, black's king, well, it's a bit open in the middle. But the problem is, if black castles here, well, with this pawn having been dragged away, you can see that that is not the safest place for black's king. And with a couple of deft moves, then white can exploit this straight away. So we'll attack this. Only decent way to defend that pawn. Move the queen back. C4, we want to stomp on here. So B6, and now queen E2. A nice little cutback having put the black queen to a poor position, passive position, then white's queen is going to bounce out to the king side and suddenly there are moves like, well, bishop b1 will follow, maybe f4 and rook f3 and swing to the king side. This is a really dangerous attack. So let's go back here. So basically the, the sort of normal move here, which would be to castle, just looks really dubious, really dangerous. So Fisher played queen a5. So he's perhaps looking to get some pressure on this pawn and still looking at that bishop as well. And here Petrosian thought for a long time and he, he played a move which he said afterwards was the most difficult of the game. And this is a really subtle move, but it's a great move. Queen c2. So one point is that it means that white can now advance this pawn, because that was pinned before. It also looks at this f pawn, that's very important. So it's basically moving the queen to sort of an open window, you could say, on, on this diagonal. Um, well, one thing is, if this bishop retreats, so that means that queen takes pawn is no longer possible, the bishop is defended, queen takes pawn, and then queen takes bishop. But actually, after bishop b3, then queen takes pawn is a threat, and that is very unpleasant for black. How do you defend that pawn? So after queen c2, Fischer decided to play pawn to f4. Now, it's possible to exchange that pawn <coughs> to, to open the e-file. That's also pleasant for white. But Petrosian here played with real vigor. Pawn to c4. So he realized he didn't mind if black exchanges here, because this actually opens these lines for white's pieces. <clears throat> um, I mean, it'd be nice to try and stop this pawn advancing. B6 tries to sort of get a blockade, but you know, this is still very, very difficult. I should say this did not happen. But for example, if white takes here and switches the rook over, well, this rook is about to come up the board, <clears throat> ready to maybe swing across to the king side maybe double here, um, don't forget bishop a4 check to you know, finally make black's king decide which side it's going. Um, just a nice initiative for white, basically. So c4 just played, Fischer took on e3, so it's getting a little bit complicated, but Petrosian didn't bother taking here because that would leave the bishop in this nice position. He just rammed on with c5. Really vigorous. So Fisher, well, desperate to exchange queens. With queens off the board, then black would have a chance to defend in this opposite color bishop position. With the queens on the board, then having opposite color bishops is a real asset to the attacker because you can't exchange off the bishops. 
So queen a4 check, king to f8. Now, it's interesting, when I was, I was looking, doing some research on the annotations for this uh, game, um, I, th this game was um, analysed by Jonathan Spielman in one of his books. And Spielman actually thought that king d8 here might be a better chance to defend. But, well, in fact, rook d1, as in the game, still leaves black in terrible trouble. I don't think it's a big surprise when the king is just kind of caught in the middle. Um, but I, th I think that's a mark of how bad black's position is, that, that Spielman was suggesting that, because, well, we'll see, the king gets cut to shreds after king f8 as well. And again, this move rook d1 is very strong. Um, it's possible for black to win material here with e2, but after this, okay, watch what happens. Yes, black wins an exchange after this, but with d6, well, all white pieces can join the attack. That bishop in particular striking down at f7, well, this is absolutely fatal. Uh, and you can see these rooks still on their starting squares are just bystanders in the position. So Petrosian played to queen e2. Interesting here, later Petrosian said that he thought g3 was a better move here. Uh, but actually his move played in the game, d6, definitely the best move. His judgment during the game was absolutely correct. So this just opens up the bishop to f7. Uh, I think he had qualms in this position about the move bishop takes h2. I should say this did not happen. Fischer actually played queen h5 here. Let's have a quick look at bishop takes h2 check. But sorry, bishop takes h2 check. Didn't happen, um, but this also wins an exchange after e2. But in fact, this is just deadly. So white is left with this beautiful pawn on e7. And here's a key move, actually, which I think was overlooked by many annotators, rook d4. In our computer age, the computer spits out this move uh, very quickly. Um, and black has absolutely no defense here. Yes, black is the exchange up. But look, with all these pieces attacking, it, it really is hopeless. Rook d4 is a key move, though. Um, and in this position, rook e4, also a key move to just hold that pawn for a moment. Um, and there is no decent defense here. Queen b3 is a nice move. Now the queen has to defend that pawn, but rook f4 check. Well, once f7 falls, you can see it's going to be mate very quickly. So bishop h2 check, originally thought to be a better defense, I'm afraid, doesn't cut it. Queen h5, played by Fischer. Now, all this had to be calculated very carefully by Petrosian, and he'd seen that, yes, there's a threat to take here. Yes, there's a threat to play e2, but actually f4 is a very powerful move. Probably the most tenacious move here is to move the bishop back. But after this, well, white still has a huge initiative. We'll probably pick up this pawn. Um, and yeah, it looks really nasty for black. Instead, Fisher played e2. Fisher, uh, Petrosian gave up the exchange. And now white turns to the attack again. So rook takes f7, threatened. Queen b3, this beautiful diagonal, mate threatened here. And now Petrosian finished off beautifully after this. So rook f6 check is threatened. Fisher played this. He gave a check and king h1 and here Fischer resigned. Now according to Petrosian, writing about this later, the spectators 
applauded thunderously for about five minutes on end. There you go, a passionate audience in Buenos Aires. The Argentinians understand their chess very well and understand their chess history. Of course, Buenos Aires hosted the 1927 World Championship match between Alikin and Capablanca. So they know their chess history. They're, they're a part of it in Buenos Aires. And they understood the significance of this game. Petrosian defeated Fischer after Fischer had won 20 classical games in a row. So suddenly the match was alive. One game all. Um, let's just finish this game off. So why did Fischer resign? Well, Mate threatened with Rook H5. Um, if Queen D1 check, the Rook comes back. But this doesn't actually help at all. Rook F6. Well, of course, you can interpose with the Queen. But, well, let's just play the, the game out to Mate. This is nice. Check. And then Queen G3. So there we go. Um, remember, if you want to see game one, then do check out the links up there and down there. If you want to subscribe, then it's free to subscribe to the channel. And you get a notification for when I post a new video. So check out, click on that subscribe button down there. Thanks very much for watching.